Okay, I think we can go ahead and start. I uh, might have a few stragglers. First few slides probably aren't that interesting. Um, this is an off-topic talk. I think we should have more of these at conferences to give us a little break from a lot of the stuff that we're doing, because sometimes after a while, it can wear down after a bit, and you want, you want something a little different. And this is a topic I happen to be extremely passionate about. Uh, this is my Occupy Mars polo. Just to make it clear how much I love this particular topic. Uh, this is not a statement about Elon Musk or SpaceX or anything like that. It's just a dream of mine. Though, to be honest, with the financial, ethical, legal, political, scientific, and engineering challenges, we're not going to see Occupy Mars within the next generation or so. Though the moon's actually interesting, but that's not what this talk is about. The search for extraterrestrial life in our solar system, it's absolutely fascinating and I think this information should be communicated more for those who are interested in the topic because it's the news isn't getting out there enough for those of you who are not familiar with me my name is Curtis Poe better known as Ovid uh, in case you're wondering that's after the Roman poet Ovid lived about 2,000 years ago long story how I picked up the nickname uh, but I enjoy his poetry if you're into poetry his translations by an academic named Peter Green are marvelous and by Peter Green I don't mean the Aerosmith guitarist I mean a an academic from Texas. Uh, this is a lot of my contact information. Don't worry about this. If you go out to slideshare.net slash Ovid, O-V-I-D, you will find this presentation up there. Uh, there will be a few changes in the slides. There always are. Uh, image credits, I like to give credit where credit is due, generally speaking. Uh, unless otherwise noted, uh, these images are going to come from NASA. NASA material, by law, is public domain unless it's classified, for the most part. There are some exceptions to that. So like there's a lot of NASA APIs you can programmatically get information from. And NASA, if you're watching this, hire me to fix your APIs. I've got web service dash NASA out on GitHub to try and fix a lot of them. But I digress. Uh, other images are, unless otherwise noted, they're PowerPoint stock images, or I will credit them on the place. <laughs> Question policy. If you do not understand something I have said, it means someone else didn't understand what I've said. I failed as a speaker. Go ahead and hold up your hand. However, aside from that, if you want to expand on that, please hold that to the end of the talk. I usually give plenty of time at the end of the talk to ask questions, but I want to make sure I can finish the talk in time. And if there's too many questions during the talk, it might mean I can't finish the talk and I miss some material, and that would be unfortunate. But... <clears throat> This is a very difficult talk because the background here gets very complex uh, and there's so many things I could possibly go into which I won't have the time for. In order to give some context to understand the search for life in our solar system, extraterrestrial life in our solar system, we have to understand a little bit about what it means and why it means that. Are we alone is a question we have asked ourselves as long as recorded history. Anaxagoras is the first recorded example I could find in the 5th century BCE. Uh, he postulated that the sun was a hot rock, the moon was a cold rock, that it were originally part of Earth, and that the moon was inhabited. And the ancient Greeks were so fascinated by this idea that they sentenced him to death. If you happen to be watching this on YouTube or some other video s service and you know your history, you want to throw something at the screen right now, that is the way the story is commonly told. There's a heck of a lot more to it. I'm not even going to go into that. Um, but <clears throat> Epicurus also speculated about extraterrestrial life in 4th century BCE, Lucretius, Plutarch, others. And even beyond them, if you look at our mythologies and our religions, we had this concept of other beings we can communicate with, have some sort of conversation with. We want to know, are we alone? It is something deep within our soul, our being. We are social creatures, not just individually, but as a society. We want to know, is our species alone? Can we communicate with something beyond this planet? It's important to us. Why? That, that's for you to decide. People have different motivations, but we care about it a lot. And when we're talking about life, this is it. Our beautiful planet that we're in the process of wrecking right now. This is all we've got. This is all we know. And we want to know if something else is out there. But the question is, what is life? And that one becomes really hard. So this is an interesting paper 
uh, where he's discussing is there a common universal basis, uh, chemical basis for life, and unfortunately most of our universal life probes are based upon looking for the ribosome. If there is another origin of life and it doesn't have a ribosome, it's not going to detect that. Now, you've probably not heard the term before, but there's something some biologists are interested in called the shadow biosphere, that there might have been a second origin, or maybe even more, on Earth, and there might be another biosphere existing beyond our own, possibly deep underground. How could we possibly detect that? If we're not even sure if there's a second biosphere here on Earth, how are we going to find it in space? It's a very complex thing. So we don't have a universal life detector. Um, a lot of people are like, why didn't we send a life detector with such and such a probe? Because we, we don't have one. And since we're arguing about, you know, what is life, you know, a lot of biologists argue, are viruses alive? Or are they just some sort of chemical process? That sounds ridiculous, but whether or not it's alive, don't know. But biology emerges from chemistry. Chemistry emerges from physics. Physics might emerge from something we don't know. Maybe that's the bottom of that stack of turtles going all the way down, and that's the bottom. Maybe there's something else. We, we actually don't know the questions to that. But I don't like a lot of the definitions for life that I found out there. Um, because what I'm looking at is there's one scientist, in fact, who collects definitions of life, and he's collected over 200. And many of them are things like, you know, can it reproduce? That's the sort of thing that you learn in, you know, school when you're like eight or nine years old. Basic biology. Can it reproduce? Well, you, when you're talking about the birds and the bees, a horse meets a donkey and they produce a mule, and the mule cannot reproduce. Is a the mule therefore not alive? Well, yeah, it, it's alive. We know it's alive. Okay, to be fair, there are a couple of mules we found which have been able to reproduce, but even if that wasn't the case, we would still say that mules are alive. Can things grow? Can they react to stimuli? Do they have metabolism? Well, the first four points are actually used as a counter-argument in some definitions of life because we can kind of argue those about fire. Though metabolism is actually something called anabolism and catabolism and fire only exhibits one of those. I won't go into that right now. Um, and I've actually seen this before. Biopresentation is not a term you'll find in the literature. It's something I came up with because when I work with software, I see this all the time in systems where ETL systems, extract, transform, load, I grab data from different sources and I have to identify, are these two things the same thing? And what I do is like, if I'm, I was doing work for pharmaceutical companies for reducing the cost of phase three clinical trials and they're looking for the cure and you've got Dr. Robert Smith at St. Mary's University and Dr. Bob Smith at St. May's University. Are those the same researcher? And what you do is you weigh up all the data points you have, you score them, you create a formula, and you can say they're probably the same person. And for life, you can weigh up a lot of these factors to say, is this thing, how well does it bio-present? And I think it's a much cleaner definition because it gets rid of the Boolean yes or no. Even if I die, I'm still a pile of living matter because of all the things inside of me. It gets very complex. And then we have to deal with the origin of life. Abiogenesis is a very complicated problem. Evolution, that's, it's pretty much accepted in the literature. There's no question about that. There's a lot of arguments about some of the specifics about evolution, but abiogenesis, how did life arise from non-life, that one gets extremely complicated, and we just don't know. But there's some amazing work being done there with assembly theory and autocatalytic sets. I don't have the time to go into. I apologize. If you're curious, you can ask me afterwards. This is where we get stuck. And this is the problem we have with looking for life outside of Earth, because we don't know how life arose in the first place. So life is a hard problem. How do you detect life if you cannot define life? We don't know. So already we're behind the eight ball. We're trying to figure out this problem. You know, is there extraterrestrial life in our solar system when we don't know what life is? But I'm going to take a little diversion. Show of hands, how many of you know the Drake equation? Okay. A fair number of you. I'm not going to go into this deeply. This is about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, the SETI Institute. Um, People ask about intelligence all the time, so I'll cover this very briefly. Uh, Dr. Frank Drake in 1961 came up with the Drake equation, which is kind of a thought experiment, a probabilistic equation of how many intelligent civilizations could we possibly detect in our galaxy. And what they came up with, what, what he came up with was this. So 
This is the number of stars formed per year, the average rate of star formation, the fraction of those with planets, how many of those can support life, how many of those which have life, how many of those which intelligent life, how many of those can communicate, and the lifespan of the civilizations. But he had a problem at this conference they had when they were putting this together. They didn't know any of those numbers in 1961. None. I think Carl Sagan was actually one of the people at this conference, if I recall correctly. Uh, but in their original estimates that they put together back then, the first three numbers, these were some of the best astronomers in their field, and they actually had pretty good numbers for this. So they estimated maybe one star was formed a year in the Milky Way. Uh, maybe 20 to 50% of those actually had planets, the number of planets that could support life for a star, one to five. And then they went crazy. Out of those that could support life, all of them go on to develop life. All of them go on to have intelligent life. Maybe 10 to 20% uh, can communicate. And lifespan of civilization anywhere from 1,000 to 100 million years. That was, you're like, why are these numbers, where are these numbers coming from? And they estimated anywhere between 20 to 50 million civilizations we might be able to detect with SETI. And a couple of things about that. One, Proxima Centauri is the closest star to Earth. It's about 4.3 light years away. There's a planet orbiting it that we believe to be in the Goldilocks zone. If that had a civilization similar to ours right now, communicating the same way as ours, SETI probably could not detect it. So that's <laughs> certainly an issue. But where do they get these weird numbers of 100% go on to have life, 100% have intelligent life? I don't know, this is very speculative, but I have a hunch that at least in the back of their minds they knew if you've played with the Drake equation, it's very easy to plug in numbers that deliver a cold, sterile universe where there is no life but our own, and that's going to be really hard to get funding for. That's a hunch, I can't prove it. Today, it's different. I've color-coded these for the, how reliable the information is. I apologize in advance if you're colorblind. Uh, rate of star formation per year in our galaxy is about six to seven stars per year. It's often estimated that around 100% of those have planets. Some estimates are around 50%, but basically most stars have planets. Number of planets per solar system which, with planets that could support life as we know it. One, that would be a planet in what we call the Goldilocks zone. Not too cold, not too hot. That's another source of controversy. Uh, and I'll cover that in just a second. Then there's the dark orange ones, the fractional planets which have life, which have intelligence, which can communicate. I put those in dark orange instead of red because there's some really interesting research going on there, which again, I don't have the time to talk about. I apologize. Civilization lifespan, not a clue. We can't possibly guess that. Of course, that's going to be dark red. But it's, we are slowly but surely knocking these numbers down. We're filling in the Drake equation. We're getting idea of how likely this is. So search for extraterrestrial life, settle. There is no institute called settle. And whenever I say life, I mean life as we know it. Pretend I put those words after the word life every single time because we don't have a lot of information here. But I do want to touch about the one planet per star, which could support life, because actually moons are planets. I'm sorry, Pluto got robbed of its planet status. It's not fun. Uh, go out to slideshare.net slash Ovid and you'll, you can find this link. The paper, long with the title, uh, but it's amazing. goes in the history of astronomy. The early astronomers actually considered the moons to be planets, and there are reasons why it's a good idea to consider them as planets for the purposes of this type of research. So if you look at these two moons up above, oh, wait, I, I lied to you. These are roughly to scale. This is Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system, one of the moons of Jupiter. And this is the planet Mercury, slightly smaller, Ganymede probably has a subsurface ocean. It actually has a magnetic field which could protect any potential life from the radiation coming off Jupiter. And Mercury is a piece of rock. And a lot of planetary scientists are screaming at their screen right now. I apologize for that. But Ganymede, the moon, is a much more likely candidate for life than Mercury is. So we don't want to discount those. I didn't put a lot of sources up there for this initial information because they are all over the place. I tried to pick acceptable, non-controversial numbers that we feel comfortable with, but we are still learning a huge amount because that's how science works. So please take everything I say with a grain of salt. But people do ask about intelligence, and they want to know about that, and I think that's very interesting. 
because the first life on Earth, Earth formed about four and a half billion years ago, and then we think that a large object the size of Mars slammed into the planet, broke off part of it, that formed the moon, and when things settled down roughly 4.3 uh, to 4 billion years ago, when it settled down to the point where Earth could support life as we understand it, life arose almost immediately afterwards, almost immediately in geological terms. Now, to some people, this is an argument that life is easy. The counter-argument is that winning the lottery is easy if you pick the right numbers. So this doesn't actually prove anything. Multicellular life, this one's interesting because it's arisen several times in our past, but complex multicellular life, uh, we could say macroscopic for a loose definition, started arising about, we think, 0.6 billion years ago. And of course, right after I put this slide together, there's a recent paper coming out of China. They found what might be worms 20 to 30 centimeters long about a billion to a billion and a half years ago, making this slide a mockery. But roughly about 0.6 billion years ago, right before the Cambrian explosion of all the different life forms, complex multicellular life started to evolve. But it was over 3 billion years from the start of life to get to complex multicellular. For those of you familiar with the Fermi paradox, this might be the answer to it because that is almost a quarter of the age of the universe. It might be that multicellular life is just really, really darn hard to get to. Lots of controversy over this, lots of hand waving, lots of these numbers, again, take with a grain of salt. <clears throat> so rough timeline, just to recap that, life arose almost instantly on our planet as soon as it could support life. Whether that's blind luck or not, we do not know. Uh, Three billion years to get to complex multicellular life. Intelligence arose almost immediately. Intelligence might be extremely common for multicellular life if you can make the gap between single cell to multicellular. And intelligence, by intelligence, I didn't mean that you know humans existed back then. There's many creatures which are intelligent. Uh, cetaceans, corvids, cephalopods. Many corvids actually have better spatial reasoning than young children. I mean, they're fascinating creatures. Octopuses are incredibly intelligent. Octopuses and humans actually shared a common ancestor. We think about 800 uh, million years ago, a very simple flatworm. And they evolved completely separately. Octopuses, they turns out they have a brain in each of their eight arms and a central brain. So they have nine brains. Very intelligent, but incredibly short lifespan. Intelligence looks like it's extremely evolutionary, ben evolutionarily beneficial. So I think intelligence could possibly be extremely common if we can get to the multicellular stage. But we have a sample size of one. That's the problem. We cannot extrapolate from any of this. This is all just speculation, science fiction, if you will. And there's other stuff I'm not going to go into right now. We're talking about uh, biosignatures and technosignatures, other ways of detecting life. Uh, some of this for detecting life around other stars. You might have heard of Tabby's star where they speculated there might have been uh, something called a type 2 Kardashev civilization. Uh, I won't go into details. It turns out that's probably not the case. Uh, but if you, you can Google for a NASA, NASA astrobiology strategy of 2015, they lay out a lot more information about how they're searching for life off Earth. And it's very detailed, very wonderful stuff. But I had to give you that background just so you had a rough basis for understanding how complex this particular topic is. Which means the talk is about to start. So I hope you enjoyed that brief introduction there. So we have many excellent candidates, it turns out, for searching for life in our solar system right now. And the first thing I want you to do is forget about the term organic molecules. Because one of the things which happens a lot is there's this breathless headline in a newspaper, complex organic molecules have been discovered in outer space. An organic molecule, there's somewhat varying definitions. Mostly this means chemistry with carbon, carbon-carbon bonds or carbon-hydrogen bonds. Uh, it just simply means carbon chemistry. That's very common. Carbon is very reactive, forms a lot of different bonds with a lot of different things. It doesn't mean life, so don't worry about the term organic. It's just unfortunate that that meaning is a little bit subtle and confusing to folks. If we do see life out there, we might not recognize it because we can't identify life yet. So what are the candidates? Some of you might recognize this uh, very famous quote, all these worlds are yours except Europa, attempt no landing there. 
Why did I include this particular slide? This is from 2010, uh, Odyssey 2 by Arthur C. Clarke. Enceladus, or sorry, Europa is, we are exploring Europa for the possibility of life, but when I write up there, when I've written on there before that it's poor in biosignatures, I didn't write it in this particular slide, it's poor in biosignatures that we've detected. So we don't have any evidence that there's something we think might possibly be living there, but it does appear to have a subsurface ocean and it could have hydrothermal vents under the ocean. And those are very interesting because they provide both energy and food for any potential life. So we could have extremophiles on Earth which could potentially survive on Europa right now. And, oh, there's where I wrote poor in biosignatures. So we haven't detected a lot of biosignatures. So I personally don't think it's one of the best candidates for searching for life, but it's still a great candidate for scientific work. And in fact, the, recently the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or JUICE, was launched uh, this year to explore Europa. It's gonna arrive in 2031. And NASA is gonna be launching the Europa Clipper in uh, next year actually. So we're going to get some more information about that. That one will actually arrive a year earlier. And uh, that's going to be wonderful. But Enceladus. Enceladus is absolutely fascinating. So this little animation right here, false color animation, you'll see some red spots down at the bottom. That's fresh ice forming. There's cryovolcanoes on Enceladus. This is the sixth largest moon of Saturn. And it has a very large subsurface ocean. And it's producing a lot of methane. Methane is considered a strong biosignature, an indication of life. Uh, methane on Earth, a lot of the methane comes from cows, cow farts. I, I'm, now I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I don't think there are aquatic cows on Enceladus. I could be wrong. I would hope to be wrong, that would be lovely. Uh, but we don't know what's causing the methane. We don't know where it's coming from and it seems very intriguing. There's some Non-biological processes, we call them abiotic processes, which can produce methane. One of them's uh, serpentinization, I always mispronounce that. Uh, but the researchers don't think it can produce enough methane. They're, they're sure it can't produce enough methane, so something else is producing the methane. And if we knew there was life on Enceladus, the default assumption would probably be that life is producing the methane. But the assumption has to be that it is not life, because that's a pretty high bar of evidence you have to cross. But Methane is considered to be a very strong biosignature in the search for life. And in fact, the Orbilander is going to launch in 2038. It's going to, it should arrive around 2050. I will be dead by then. Thank you, NASA. I'm a little bit disappointed by that. That one's interesting. It's going to orbit uh, Enceladus for 200 days, taking two samples per day. And that's going to be very difficult because Enceladus is about 1% of Earth's gravity Saturn's gravity obviously is very strong. It's going to do a lot of what are called station keeping maneuvers to keep it in orbit. And then it's going to land. It's going to use the information it gathered while orbiting to find a great place to land to take even more samples because the cryovolcanoes, you can see them right there. They're spitting up ice and water. They're spitting out lots of organic materials that we can detect. Again, don't worry about the word organic, but something strange is going on, including the methane. And we want to try and find out what the heck's going on there. Very exciting stuff. Titan. Oh, I love Titan. Titan's absolutely fascinating. A uh, beautiful moon. Uh, this is the largest of Saturn's moons, and it is the only known place in the solar system outside of Earth that has lakes and rivers. Um, these are hydrocarbons. It has a methane atmosphere. And it's about 180 degrees Celsius on the surface, so it's not really hospitable for us. Uh, this is an image we actually took from the surface of Titan. And it's rather interesting because it's got a methane atmosphere. Hydrogen is an extremely light atom. And what happens with hydrogen quite often in its atmospheres, it floats upwards and then the solar wind can carry it away because it's so light, it's just easy. So a lot of hydrogen just escapes atmospheres of planets. The hydrogen from what we've observed on Titan is actually descending and not reaching the surface. There should be a lot of acetylene, acetylene on Titan. It's not there. And there's some interesting papers published back in 2010, I think it is, that these are consistent with our hypotheses, our speculations about methane-based life, using hydrogen instead of oxygen, using acetylene as a food source instead of glucose or something else strongly suggestive of that, except again, we have to assume there's some chemical processes going on that we don't understand. 
or we have modeled things incorrectly, or we have measured things incorrectly. There's all sorts of reasons why this could be wrong, but it's fascinating biochemistry. Absolutely wonderful. There's a dragonfly mission, which should, uh, was going to launch in 2027, arrive in 2034. I'm very sad about this. Uh, it's still on. Uh, it's a quadcopter mission, and it's going to visit. The intent is going to visit multiple sites on Titan and be exploring the prebiotic chemistry there. And basically, this is an animation NASA cooked up to give people an idea of what's going to happen. The problem is uh, in the in the recent uh, budget coming out of Congress. They slashed the budget for uh, the Mars sample return mission, which I won't cover right now, and also for Firefly. There's various reasons why they did that. It's a long story. Uh, Firefly has a lot of technical challenges, and it's not clear when it's going to launch at this point. This is very disappointing because Titan, if there is life on Titan, methane-based, uh, that's still carbon-based, by the way, methane-based instead of water-based, it's a very, very high chance it does not share a common origin with us, and that would be incredibly exciting. Something strange is going on in Titan. We don't know what it is, but it's very expensive to get there and check. So that's enough of the moons. They're still planets for the purposes of this. Let's talk about what we traditionally think of as planets, and we'll talk about Venus. So Venus, most of you know Venus. Venus is a hellhole. You do not want to go vacationing on Venus anytime soon. I've got to Occupy Mars. I'm not going to wear an Occupy Venus t-shirt anytime soon. There's ideas about floating cloud cities on Venus, aka Star Wars, stuff like that. Um, I'm not going to go into that. That's uh, interesting stuff. But Venus is very problematic. But we've visited Venus before. In fact, the Soviet Union did with their Venera landers. That's a photograph of the surface of Venus. At the surface, it's 92 times Earth's sea level atmospheric pressure, 470 degrees Celsius. If it doesn't crush you, it's going to cook you instantly. And, you know, the icing on the cake is the clouds are sulfuric acid. This is a hostile environment, a very difficult environment. It's an environment we've detected phosphine. This is a professor of astronomy, Dr. Jane Greaves, uh, in Cardiff University in Wales. This came out a couple of years ago. Uh, she led a team of astronomers which detected phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. I almost cut this slide. And then some new research came out. Uh, it's, it's a long story. Basically, there's no known major terrestrial uh, abiotic sources of phosphine. There, there are some with volcanism and stuff, but basically it doesn't happen a lot. Non-terrestrial uh, planets like Jupiter, Saturn, they can produce phosphine, but phosphine should not be showing up in the atmosphere of Venus at all, uh, or very little of it. It degrades very quickly. The assumption, again, would be life is producing this. Um, it's produced readily on Earth with anaerobic systems. Where is the phosphine coming from? And then a bunch of researchers came along and said, no, 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 you did all of this wrong. There was no phosphine. And then I was listening to a podcast a while ago when it was either, uh, ooh, the Off Nominal or maybe the We Martians podcast, the latter of which is now ended, where she said, actually, I wish those researchers had talked to us because we explored all of their counter-arguments and we could have told them why they got this wrong. And then she revealed two other uh, sets of instruments with three different instruments on them have also independently detected phosphine on Venus. And I thought this was groundbreaking news. At first, this was all over the news. Maybe there's life on Mars. There's phosphine there, or Venus, sorry, phosphine there. And then this all went away, and then when she said, no, the phosphine's really there, people forgot about the story, didn't get picked up again. And then she released a paper, and there's a little bit more traction on this. Yes, it looks like there may be phosphine in the atmosphere. We can't explain it. We don't know what's going on. Something very unusual is happening on Venus. But how could there be life on Venus? Our current model suggests that about 4 billion years ago, there was a lot of water on Venus. It was not the hellhole that it is today. And it could have supported life at one point, potentially. Uh, and today, possibly what we call extremophiles. So a lot of people aren't familiar with extremophiles. They were first discovered in 1969 by uh, uh, Tom Brock, uh, Thermos Aquaticus. He was examining some water which was too hot to support life, but being a biologist, he saw there was clearly life of some sort in the water and he found uh, bacteria, basically, which could survive temperature extremes. Today, we know there's bacteria which can survive extremes of, you know, pH, uh, acidity, base, uh, ionizing radiation, all sorts of things. Extremophiles can, they exist all over the planet because it turns out life finds a way. 
it is powerful. And could have extremophiles have ex evolved on Venus to survive the harsh conditions? Now, it turns out 10 meters below the surface of Venus, it might only be 200 degrees Celsius. Extremophiles could potentially exist there. Uh, in the clouds, the clouds are actually fairly comfortable. It's the most, just above the clouds on Venus is the most Earth-like place in the solar system outside of Earth. And the Venera 13 mushrooms, those are photos of them from a paper. Uh, this is uh, some Russian scientists revisiting the data from the Soviet era scientists. They, this is wild. Um, it's serious research, and they have all sorts of caveats, but they talk about mushrooms, scorpions, all sorts of weird things. You know, we took a picture of this, and then we took a picture later, and that thing was gone. Did it move? Uh, it's really weird out there stuff, but this is how strange the research and the stuff gets. But no, I don't think it was life. But the Venus clouds are particularly interesting because about 60 kilometers above, it's Earth-like temperatures and pressure, and there's something we know of called uh, dark absorbers in the clouds. They're absorbing ultraviolet radiation and changing the weather conditions on Venus. We don't know what they are. And one scientist explained, it's very difficult to explain with abiotic processes. In other words, non-living processes. A living process would easily explain the dark absorbers. But again, we have to assume it's not life. But we combine the dark absorbers with the phosphine results, we really need to get some probes to Venus to start investigating this. And unfortunately, Venus is one of the least visited places, even though it's one of the most accessible. And I think a lot of this is historically, the Soviet Union visited Venus, the United States visited Mars, so Mars captures all the attention now. So we'll talk about Mars. Mars has surprises if you don't know anything about the history of this. So Mars used to be a water world. Maybe it'll be a water world again if we can ever terraform it. Um, about four and a half billion years ago, uh, had oceans, probably around the what we consider to be North Pole today. Uh, and there's a good chance it was habitable even before Earth. And we know that a lot of complex organic molecules in space can, bar can bombard the planets and bring a lot of the ingredients for life to the planet. The way they did for Earth, they did the same thing for Mars. Maybe something could have happened there. And Mars actually had a magnetosphere, which may have lasted as recently as about a billion years ago, and that would have helped to shield the life from a lot of the sun's radiation. Today, that life would destroy a lot of, that radiation would destroy a lot of life that's on the ground. <clears throat> and today, we have Curiosity, Perseverance, and Zhurong, which is a Chinese rover, roving around the surface. Uh, we have seven operational orbiters going around the planet. And today, we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about the bottom of the Earth's oceans in spots. I mean, it's a fairly well-studied planet. But some of you may remember back in 1996, this uh, really exciting news conference from NASA when they talked about, you know, did we find fossils? And this was obviously a very controversial idea. Uh, they discovered magnetite crystals in the Basically, they discovered a meteorite in Antarctica from Mars, and they discovered magnetite crystals on there. And at the time, there was no abiotic process which was known to produce magnetite. This is clearly something that's produced by organic, by living processes. Um, and then there's that photo you have. That looks an awful lot like, you know, what we would think a life form would be. Today, we know that magnetite crystals can be formed by shock waves. Obviously, you know, a meteorite hitting Earth is probably going to have some of those. Uh, whatever that thing is up there, we think it's probably too small to be life. It might just be contamination of the sample. However, <clears throat> it did restart the Mars exploration program, which had a few bumps, but it's now going fairly well. <clears throat> so that, I, I'm not worried about that. It's, it's somewhat controversial, but I don't think any scientists take this seriously as evidence of life. But there's methane on Mars. We don't know where it's coming from. Uh, methane, again, is considered to be a very strong biosignature. And we just don't know where it's coming from. It should degrade very quickly in the atmosphere, but it's hanging around. And at first, there were arguments as to whether or not the methane was there. Now we accept the fact that the methane does exist. And it has a strong seasonal variation. So in Gale Crater, these are the seasonal variations of the oxygen and methane content. When it gets warmer, there's more of it which is what you would expect of biological activity. 
or maybe chemical processes with more energy poured into it. Again, the default assumption always has to be it is not life, but something's going on, and we'd like to know what it is. By the way, if you're curious about Gale Crater, uh, if you've ever visited like weather.com, NASA has a version of that, so you can get the latest weather data from Mars. Uh, you'll notice on Sol 3785, there's a high of three degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty cool. By the way, they call it a Sol on Mars because a Sol is the Martian equivalent of a day. It's roughly half an hour longer than our hours, but there are 24 hours in a Martian day. They've taken every second minute hour. They basically expanded the time just a little bit to account for that half hour offset. But they call it a Sol instead of a day to make it clear that it's not an Earth day. So we don't know what's going on with that. Absolutely no explanation for it. We don't have any explanation for abiotic processes which could cause this. Uh, but again, we assume that it's not life because we have to. But it's the Viking landers which really fascinate the heck out of me. Uh, what I'm about to talk about right now is extremely controversial and most scientists say no, but it's, it's worth mentioning. In 1976, Viking 1, Viking 2 landed on Mars. They were about 6,000 kilometers apart, and they wanted to know, was there life on Mars? So they were searching for evidence of life on Mars. They used something called the Grass Chromatograph uh, Mass Spectrometer, uh, GC GCMS, because I can actually pronounce GCMS. And it didn't measure many organic molecules that we thought were necessary for life. It turns out there's a lot of organic molecules on Mars. The, the GCMS actually frequently failed when it was on Earth, <laughs> when it was being tested on Earth, so obviously going to Mars, very high failure rate. Um, I'm not going to go into that too much right now because it's, that one was kind of a bust of an experiment. It's a labeled release experiment, which I really find absolutely fascinating. This was tested on Earth. Uh, basically, the idea was we're going to take a nutrient solution and we're going to inject this into the soil of Mars, basically spraying chicken soup on some dirt. And this nutrient solution had carbon-14, which is radioactive. So if there is some sort of metabolism which releases a carbon-14, we can detect this in the air, in the atmosphere, above the soil sample. This is tested extensively on Earth with known sterile soil, with uh, living soil. Uh, well, obviously not known sterile soil, that doesn't make sense, but basically sterile material. And we're very, very comfortable with results on Earth. On Mars, it was interesting. Both landers which tried this experiment uh, tested positive for metabolism. Something was happening in the soil which released the carbon-14 into the air. Now, when we increased the temperature to 50 degrees Celsius, there was significantly less activity which you would expect from some of this life dying off. Obviously, existing in a very cold environment, a warm environment is going to be very lethal to it. <clears throat> Both samples, when you heated them above 160 degrees, no activity whatsoever, which would be consistent with killing off all the life. And also, they were retested when they were kept in the dark for 10 degrees Celsius for two months, uh, life starved to death. We did this repeatedly on Earth to make sure we had a good baseline of how life was going to behave. And that's what we saw on Mars. Formate. Formate was one of the first explanations of how this behavior could be happening abiotically. Uh, it can replicate the results with nearly sterile soil. So sterile soil would act like it had metabolic activity. It would release the carbon-14 in the air. But they didn't have a sterilization control experiment with the formate, and it turns out there's probably very little formate on Mars. So it's unlikely that formate is an explanation for this. There is a lot of perchlorate on Mars. Perchlorate is one of the biggest obstacles we have for visiting Mars because it's somewhat poisonous to us. Uh, it's not very healthy. Uh, it was detected on Mars back in 2009. It can also produce a positive results that the labeled release experiment did. However, those results do not break down at 160 degrees Celsius. At that temperature, you spray the soil with perchlorate with this nutrient solution. It's still going to release the carbon-14. So perchlorate does not replicate these results. So again, we have evidence for something which looks a lot like metabolism, just like we'd see on Earth. And then people said hypochlorite. Hypochlorite, uh, basically radiation hits Mars all the time, and it can turn perchlorate into hypochlorite. And this also, uh, it could produce the same results as label release 
experiment, and it does break down at 160 degrees Celsius. So here we have a chemical process, disappointing, but it's part of the results of science, which could possibly duplicate the life processes. It is the best abiotic candidate that I'm aware of for labeled release experiments. However, it was never tested at the 50 degrees Celsius mark of significantly reduced behavior, and it was never tested with a long-term dark storage. Why on earth they didn't try to consistently replicate these results with hypochlorite that they saw with the labeled release experiment, I don't know. I think they should, because if we have something abiotic which can rule out the, rule out the pos or give an alternative explanation to metabolism, it is extremely important. So, because they didn't test it in all the conditions, we don't have any non-living process which can replicate what we observed on Mars in 1976. There is one thing, though. Uh, we did apparently inject this solution with the, inject the soil with the nutrient solution two more times, and we didn't observe these results. And this could be, they say, because, well, the chemical process already occurred, so it's not going to occur again, so obviously this is abiotic. Or it could be slower metabolism. Maybe the organisms were full and they didn't replicate the process. Or maybe the nutrient solution was poisonous to these and they experienced metabolism and then died. We just don't know. We can't answer this. But it's one of those many, many tantalizing hints that there is so much interesting chemistry out there which appears to mimic life, which we can't explain without life, even though we have to assume that it's life. So um, you probably know my stance on this topic. Arnold can explain it to you. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but we might wonder, what would extraterrestrial life mean? Because we want to know about the meaning of this. This is what we care about deeply. It's not going to mean much, actually. But it can nurture our soul because we care about this. We've been asking about this forever. Are we alone? We want to know. So we need to wonder about the origin of this life. If we can't determine the origin of this life, if we detect it, that doesn't tell us much, but there's going to be obviously a lot of scientific research. If it has a common origin with us, then this is going to bolster something called the panspermia hypothesis, which I won't go into right now. Uh, basically, it's life can spread from planet to planet, more or less still asks the question, where did the life originate? If it has a separate origin, if it's methane-based, like in Titan, that's probably a separate origin from our own. If it's carbon-based, but it doesn't have DNA or RNA, uh, if it has the wrong chirality, basically, I won't go into that right now. It's a long story. Um, if it doesn't have a common origin with us, uh, this could actually be exciting because it means, wow, a new strand of life. But it could be very scary if you start thinking about the Fermi paradox, the idea being if the universe is teeming with life, where is it? Um, and there's a lot of questions about things called the Great Filter and other ideas of, you know, maybe life has kind of a hard limit kind of built in. But I'll skip that. You can ask me about that later on if you want to. So I start thinking about this uh, different way of looking at it. If, if it turns out there's a separate origin of life, we can discover in our own solar system. We consider the number of stars out there, the fraction of those with planets, which is obviously greater than 50%. By the way, there are, it is now estimated there might be more rogue planets not orbiting stars than there are stars. A lot of those orbiting plant, a lot of those rogue planets could have hot cores, which could be keeping life alive outside of star systems. Plenty of places for this. The number of those which can actually support life then we can know about the fraction of those which actually have life. We can start filling in that final number for estimating the amount of life which is actually in the universe. And if we find another source of life, it's virtually guaranteed the universe is absolutely teeming with life, which to me would be one of the most wonderful things in the world. Uh, final comment I'll make, I didn't really have time to go into this, which came first, the chicken and the metabolism. Uh, if you're curious about this, look up something called autocatalytic sets, this is an idea which comes from assembly theory, or is related to it, I won't go into that. Basically, we've discovered the notion of a chemical acts as a catalyst which uh, produces another chemical, which acts as a catalyst, produces another chemical, and so on and so on, until eventually something acts as a catalyst to produce that first chemical, and you have a set of chemicals which can autocatalyze and keep reproducing themselves. It's metabolism without life. And as it turns out, 
if this is common, uh, the researcher Cronin, uh, he's with, uh, ooh, it's professor of chemistry, I can't remember which university right now, my apologies. Uh, he's actually identified an autocatalytic set with molybdenum salts, and he's looking for more. If it turns out these are common, it might be the case that any place where we have enough elements and enough energy, life, instead of being an oddity, might be an inevitability, which to me would be just joyful. I would obviously care about this quite a bit. Uh, anyway, if you have questions about any of this, uh, you can ask them now. There are other things I might discuss with you afterwards. I could talk to you about the space industry, uh, competitors to SpaceX, the politics, the economics, anything you want to know about that, I'd be happy to discuss that with you. But if you have any questions about life or any of the stuff I covered right now, I'd be happy to answer some of those for you. Or try to. Two questions. Um, are you extraterrestrial? I'm an American. I have a right to remain silent. Second question. Can you prove it? <laughs> can I prove I'm American? As a matter of fact, I have my passport right here in my pocket. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. No, you said you, it's hard to define what life is, what extraterrestrial, uh, extraterrestrial life is. So. I'm sorry, could you speak up just a hair? I'm yes. hearing. No, that's not you, it's me, trust me. Speak. I, you said it's hard to define what life actually is, where life starts and where, life is not, where it's not life. So mm -hmm. you can extend the question to, yeah, are we really terrestrial or are we not? Whether or not we're terrestrial, that's an interesting topic. Uh, there's some speculation that life might have formed on Mars first. We have Martian meteorites, which we found on Earth. We can examine them, their composition, figure out their origin. And there's some speculation that possibly life formed there first, and it was able to survive the transition to Earth and struck here, and life was seeded. We could all be Martians. Uh, there has been uh, research done on the ISS where they've taken uh, microbes, they've put them on the outside of the ISS, and they've managed to survive. There's a lot of discussion and research into, this is part of something called the panspermia hypothesis, that life has come from elsewhere and is seeding life now. So we, we may not be from Earth originally, and but we don't know. Maybe another question. What about are these probes sterilized so that they don't transport uh, uh, terrestrial <laughs> life to Mars or Titan? Okay. When I mentioned my goal is to, I would love to see us colonize Mars, and I mentioned the ethical problems. That was the very first one I mentioned because I think it's the most important. Uh, NASA has something called the Planetary Protection Program, and they work their darndest to sterilize these probes like mad, and they found out no matter how hard they try, uh, life finds a way. It's still on the probes. And yes, we are sending life to other planets right now. Um, but Mars is pretty hostile to Earth life. The problem is, when you send humans to Mars, sending humans to the moon, probably less of an issue. You send it to Mars if there's already extant life there. Humans are basically big bags of bacteria. We are aquariums of bacteria. We're going to be dumping on the surface of Mars. And if there is life there, I think it is very, a very reasonable question to ask, you know, should we actually be doing that? Should we be killing off native life if there's that thing there? I think what would actually happen is if we discover life there, we're going to say, ah, what the heck, we're going to do it anyway, uh, because that's what we tend to do. But uh, we are trying very hard to make sure that doesn't happen. But as soon as we send humans there, all bets are off. So on a planetary scale, humans are kind of sperms. Um, can I say that at a conference? Uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, to kind of pick up a little bit what um, was just said, you know, there's a whole lot of like sci-fi and pop and pop culture, and uh, so there are also a lot of nutters about this. How do you actually seriously, as a hobby, research this, and like, how do you? not fall into the trap of all the nutters and only find uh, the, the good resources? Um, okay, that's, uh, that's an excellent question. One of my favorite resources is going to uh, Google Scholar to find peer-reviewed papers, to find out uh, what the information is. That one is uh, very difficult because if, you're, if you don't have a deep background in some of those, uh, they can be extremely hard to follow and you could read the abstract and your brain falls out. 
And they're not writing for the generic audience. The generic audience is being written to by things like uh, Ars Technica, Space Daily, stuff like that. They provide great information. They're very reliable. There's also uh, spacenews.com, which is another good source. But then when you're reading that information, you have to start building up a background of knowledge about you know what's BS, what's not. When you like read organic molecules in space, you automatically that flies you know, raises red flags, and then I like to go out to Google Scholar or Archive Preprint Server, stuff like that, and try and find some of the latest research on that. Uh, I try to be very careful about visiting uh, websites that I don't know terribly well. So, like on mine, ovid.github.io, I've got some articles about space. Take those with a grain of salt for the same reason. Um, do not consider me to be an expert on that. Google Scholar is one of your best bets, though it can be very hard to read. Uh, so you mostly uh, provided with um, uh, pictures from NASA, and uh, so you uh, source your information from uh, mainly scholar research, but with the development of, um, I would say, uh, uh, emitter uh, rocketry and CubeSats, would you be eager to be involved in, like, I don't know, running your own space program or something? Oh, I'd be delighted to do something like that, but I wouldn't have the qualifications to do that. Um, I'm more of a, you know, outside of programming, I'm also a professional speaker, uh, so I tend to do stuff more like that. I popularize stuff to the level that I can kind of understand it. Um, but the space industry itself is absolutely fascinating, and it's amazing to watch what's going on right now, particularly with the small and mid-sized launch industry, which has kind of hit a stranglehold point right now. But it's fascinating to watch. There's great stuff coming out. I would love to be involved with that in any way, shape, or form that I could, but I also have to pay the bills. <laughs> and um, by the way, um, if some people want to go into like private rocketry, but without fitting the SpaceX uh, program, there is uh, this uh, company which is called uh, Copenhagen Suborbit Suborbitals. So it's a, a European citizen initiative, and they are like collecting funds and doing their like non-governmentized uh, space program. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and feel free to contact me afterwards. Uh, I'd be happy to chat with any of you about this stuff. I love it. Obviously. Thank you.